Number 10, corsets. Hey, what's more lethal than being constricted by a garment that it really is unnecessary unless well, unless you really need some support for the chest. I'm sure most ladies are familiar with what a corset is simply because I too would be afraid of them. They're not They're not fun. Nobody likes being squeezed or chokeslammed like one of the Undertaker's victims. Oof, no thanks, that guy's scary. The corset was a garment that went under the dress to help squish together everything. Tummy, chest, all into the desired look. Trouble is, well, they're tight, they're not comfy, and well, they can actually cause a lot of health issues, especially in warmer climates. Breathing becomes an issue and women have been known to faint. While not a dress itself, yes, I know, but for hundreds of years, it did go with every dress. So I say that counts because you couldn't wear a dress without one. Number nine, Muslin disease. This one is just crazy, man. Okay, let's take a look back at the 18th and 19th century France, where there was a law against the peasant class wearing more than four kilograms in weight of clothing. Ooh, what? Thus preventing the lower class from owning higher quality fabrics that were strictly reserved for the rich and wealthy. Ooh, that's scandalous. So a lot of times women would disregard their undergarments, which that is crazy enough alone. However, what's really crazy is that they would wear Muslin dresses, which were often dampened with water before going out to have a light, breezy, and cool outfit to wear in the summer. Plus, it was kind of see-through, so you could kind of see all the, the curves in all the right places. The trouble is, sometimes these light fabrics were wetted down and worn in less than prime weather conditions, and some people, well, they got really sick. It was actually suspected to be the reason for the 1803 influenza outbreak in Paris. Was it? Maybe? Did it contribute? Probably, but not the main reason. Still though, that's crazy. Number eight, the hobble skirt. I'm not gonna come out here and pretend that I know a whole lot about fashion, cause folks, I don't. Heck, if it's plaid, simple, or well, it's, if it smells clean, I'm, I'm probably just gonna wear it. I like my clothes to feel free so I can have movement, so I can do all the crazy antics I do here on this channel. I hate being confined, and I imagine a lot of women feel this way too, so I can just imagine how much fun wearing the hobble skirt is. Not a lot of fun. A long skirt that has a more narrow bottom, specifically designed to enable the user's movement because well, you know, God forbid a woman wants to keep a brisk pace in the summer or something. The crazy part is there's stories of women falling and tripping and getting hurt from the hobble skirts, and in extreme cases, even fatal, which maybe we should stop wearing them. We, we kind of have. Which to me, that just says it all. Rose in 1997's Titanic is actually wearing one where she trips and stumbles. Oh, see, look at that. I made a movie connection there too. Oh, there you go. Look at that. Number seven, Shields Green. Ever since humans started wearing fabric, we've wanted and found ways to stylize and color. It's what we do. The Romans, oh, how opulent they were. They loved purple. The Egyptians, now they love blue. Folks living in the Victorian era, they loved green. To be specific, a particular shade of green. There was a common color back then called Shields Green. It was made in the lab by a spooky, scary Swedish guy, Flinga Forga Borgen. That's what they do in the lab. That's what I was told. I don't know. Or make IKEA furniture. This color was used in everything dresses, fabric, paint. As the Valley Girls would say, it's totally in. The trouble is, it was comprised of a compound of copper and arsenic. Therefore, it was toxic and it actually caused a lot of harm. It also had links to cancer. The most famous case was Napoleon Bonaparte, when he was banished to St. Helena, the walls in his house were painted with the shade of Shields Green. It might have actually contributed to him, uh, him passing. He died of stomach cancer, so he passed away of stomach cancer, so it might have contributed. Number six, pestilence. This could really be any time in history, considering how many viruses have gone around in human history, but this was an issue in Victorian times. Cities were growing larger, especially with the Industrial Revolution firing on all cylinders. It must have been a crazy time to be alive. For the rich, they mostly dodged that, but not always. In the case of laundry, well, wealthy people couldn't be bothered to do their own laundry. I mean, they're wealthy, that's what they do. And sometimes would have them washed and taken by launderers who washed their clothes with the rest of the city. Being that the clothes were washed with the rest of the clothes or washed by those in poor areas, there was a lot of sickness going around at the time and well, they're contagious. A lot of times the illnesses would cling to fabrics and when given back to their customers could very well come down with whatever London was feeling at the time. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun because it wasn't a lot of fun. It's kind of like the silent, the silent undoer, not good. 
Yeah, gross. So you put on your dress, next thing you know, you're in bed for three weeks and you croak. Number five, beetle dresses. There's been a lot of crazy dresses in history. I mean, Lady Gaga alone would be the whole list at this rate. The meat dress was insane in my opinion. I mean, can you imagine wearing a whole meat dress? How bad that would smell after an hour in the hot California sun? Ooh, no thanks. Plus, not to mention all the other weird and wacky things celebrities have worn. That's, there's just too many to mention. I'm here all day. Well, what if I told you a dress from the past rivals some of our modern craziness? Hard to believe. There was a trend in the 19th century to sew beetle car faces right into their dresses. That's the that's the hard stuff on the bugs and the and the vertebrae and all that gross stuff. Ooh, gross things. Similar to how women of ancient Egypt would crush the colorful bugs up to make a makeup, these were sewn into the dresses to make some sort of weird, freaky, colorful embroidery. And to be fair, it looks good, but nah, I'll pass. What are you wearing tonight? I'm wearing the cockroaches I found in my basement. Oh yes. <laughs> Gross. Number four, crinoline. Crinoline is an underskirt frame made from tough horse hair to form an almost bell-shaped cage that will go underneath the dress in order to give the wearer a much fuller and royal look. You've seen them before, you know, those big cages. You've seen them. Now, besides the fact that you're literally walking around in a cage, which I honestly can't think of a better metaphor for women in the 18th and 19th centuries to break free from, but there's one main issue that I cannot get over. You're going to get in the way of stuff. Just That's just how it's gonna happen. Happen. Trying to get into doorways, carriages, really anything would be difficult when you've got a lot of extra hip there. It's, it's not cool. Also, not to mention, the fabric may get caught in something, such as machinery, which, as some stories tell us, may have actually happened and could possibly have been fatal, which that's not a good way to go. There's good ways to go. That's not one of them. Talk to the chief, not it. Number three, aniline dye. The year was 1856 and life was great, or not so great depending on who you ask. If you ask a rich guy, it was probably good. A poor guy, probably not. There was lots of illnesses to be had and lots of folks had siblings who perished young from being ill. Everyone's got a story like, uh, my sister, right, she never made it, but she never made it. She's not here anymore. Anyway, William Henry Perkin was a man on a mission to cure as many illnesses as he could. Many Imperial soldiers were feeling a lot of those illnesses at the time, specifically malaria. He was trying to create an anti-malaria drug using aniline. Hmm. Well, he did not find a cure for malaria, but he did discover it makes a very lovely dye. So. Task failed successfully, I guess. It was a dye that makes deep reds, purples, and even black. Ooh, naturally, this picked up a lot of steam. Or roll, paint roller, I guess, because dye, funny color. Ha, <laughs> good joke. Anyway, and it began to be used in everything from socks to shoe polish. The trouble is, once people got enough exposure to clothing with aniline dye, their skin would go red, itchy, and severely inflamed, and was known for causing really bad headaches. That's because it would absorb through their skin and their bloodstream and poison their blood. Blood. That's bad. That's not good. We don't like that here. Sure, there's bad outfits out there, but blood poisoning? Yeesh. Ugh, no thanks. Number two, cellulose nitrate. You take some nitric acid, you take some sulfuric acid, you mix it together and run it through some flammable material or a medium such as cotton, and bada bing, bada boom, literally, you got yourself some cellulose nitrate. The process was commonly done on clothes back in the late 19th century, which is just an awful idea. Some people might think it's because you're wearing volatile compounds, which is very true. That that's very true. But imagine a warehouse full of garments treated with this stuff. Uh-oh, not good. Especially considering how unstable it is. Chemistry fans will agree with me when I say while it's different, it's actually very similar to nitroglycerin, which was used to detonate large rocks and pathways when the railroads were being built across the nations. Canada and the US, of course, I'm talking about. It wasn't good. A lot of people got hurt in that one. Wasn't good. Number one, the revenge dress. We've talked about a lot of naughty stuff on this list and on this channel, so it's time for some levity. What What's the deadliest dress out there? Well, that would have to be Princess Diana's revenge dress. Ooh. Worn by Princess Diana after her husband, Prince Charles, publicly admitted to an affair. What? Scandalous. Which, for royals, is a big no-no. You kind of can't really do anything without the media noticing. This dress is also lethal because, well, there's a good chance Diana maybe sort of kind of was done in by the royal family a couple years after she wore the dress. It, was, it wasn't too long after that. Plus, if it's called the revenge dress, I mean, come on, she was out for revenge. She was out for the out for the blood. That counts, sure, a little bit of fun. Kicking off the list at number 10, arsenic dresses. 
If looks could kill, here we go. Back in 1861, a poet by the name of Henry Watshaw Longfellow, Longfellow, great last name, really love that. His wife, Fanny, her dress caught on fire and her burns were so bad that she sadly didn't survive. These dresses back then, they were flammable as is. And the fact that candles were used everywhere obviously didn't help. You're a walking ball of cotton and some of these dresses were six feet wide cages, literally, I'll get into that later on. But arsenic dresses were on a whole new level of deadly. Even without the lit candles, this dress could already just kill you. Arsenic was used back then to get that green look. Real arsenic was used. It wasn't just in clothing either. Back in 1861, an artificial flower maker named Matilda Schurer used green arsenic laced powder and ended up dying a horrible, horrible way. Her fingernails had turned green, green foam was coming out of their mouth, the whites of her eyes had turned green. Arsenic is not supposed to be inhaled, let alone worn. Yeah, the 1800s were a wild time. And believe me, it only gets weirder from here. Number nine, the hobble skirt. Here we go, we're gonna slowly walk like penguins for this one. Just from this 1910 headline alone, the hobble skirt sounds like a good time. The June 12 headline reads, the hobble is the latest freak in women fashion. Skirts that are so tight around the ankle that locomotion is seriously impeded and speed is impossible. Doesn't that pull you in? I want one already, let's do it, let's. French designer Paul Poiret made these to free the bust while shackling the legs. Just what you need to move around on uneven stone roads back hundreds of years ago. We love it. Love the practicality of the outfit. Despite how ridiculous and unsafe the hobble skirt looks and is, only the wealthy could afford such a thing. Middle and lower class women wore skirts with slits or buttons like losers. Ha, what are you, walking? So they could actually walk around, you know? What a weird thing to do. These hobble skirts were worn by the, you know, the fancy and they were like, Mm, we don't walk, we're too fancy for that. We'll just stand in one place and do this a lot. And also this, I guess. I don't know what this is. These hobble skirts were so popular at the time that upper class folks sought out a new fashion trend that made them look even fancier than the rest. So they just did it for clout. And they look stupid. I'll say, they look kind of stupid. Number eight, macaroni. This one's extra cheesy. Macaroni joke, we got it. Back in the mid 1700s, aristocratic British men would wear these large wigs, and I mean large, large wigs. These things were comedically big, but what would make them so unique was the tiny little hat on top of this massive wig. Or it was a feather, a feather or a little hat. A little Monopoly sized piece hat, just right on top of this. The Yankee Doodle Rhyme mentions this macaroni, that's the macaroni they're referring to. Stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. He called it KD Mac and Cheese. These British men were inspired after traveling across Europe and it's named after macaroni like the pasta because it signifies sophistication and worldliness. Every time I eat KD I'll be like sophistication, sophisticatedication. That was the whole point of the rhyme that any average Joe can just put a old feather in their hair and then be as valuable as macaroni. You can be macaroni guys, you can do it. Hit that thumbs up and then we'll all be macaroni. Number seven, the hoop skirt. The hoop skirt is way too much. I mean, for starters, it looks like something you would find on a playground. Children can for sure do chin-ups on the hoop skirt. These skirts were six foot wide, like hoops, they were the talk of the town. Would have been perfect for the pandemic, actually, six by six, nice. They were the talk of the town around the 1700s and it was often handmade from whalebone or basket willow. And if you attended King Louis XVI's court, it might as well be a packed bar. You're sneaking by everybody, these small passageways between people and their now six foot hoop radius skirts. It's not, not practical at all, but they did look fancy. Later on in the mid 1800s, a newer version of the skirt came out and these were better because they were made of steel. I'm not joking. This was considered new and or improved. They could produce these more often now being made of steel, so this was really the first time in history where your legs could also actually move around while you looked good. We went from hobble skirts to cage skirts. I think we're getting better. I think, maybe? Number six, paper dresses. Okay, we're not getting better at all. Moving on to some modern fashion trends, this short-lived fad was introduced in the 1960s. Paper dresses. Yes, it's as ridiculous as it sounds. Paper dresses to go-go. Just don't spill anything at all or make any sudden movements and you're good. You ever played Paper Mario? You're basically cosplaying Paper Mario. The Scott Paper Company made these, not expecting the reaction that it got. It caught on quick, of course. Fidget spinners were only four years ago, so if you want to talk about paper dresses, open that cupboard and check yourself before you wreck yourself. It only took six months for this casual paper company to start selling more than half a million paper dresses. They couldn't even keep up with this work. It went so well that other companies hopped on board and they too began making these paper dresses. It was just everywhere. Over three million dollars were spent 
on this fad. Andy Warhol was even in on the mix at one point. It was a big deal. They weren't made of flimsy printer paper either. It wasn't as bad as I'm making it sound, but it certainly wasn't good either. The dress was made of a disposable material called DuraWeave. Believe it or not, slightly water and slightly fire resistant. Unlike those puffy middle-aged dresses, it was a bit better. It's been compared to the thick paper bit that you get when you're at the dentist, that flimsy material that bunches up and then pokes your neck, it has like the weird chain that's not really connected too well, that tiny little clip thing. It's made of that, a whole dress made of that. Have fun at prom, don't light on fire. Number five, wax cones. This next one we need to bring back. I'm tired of washing my beanie. It smells, you don't wanna know, honestly. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. We're going way back for this one. They would sit on top of your head, and back in 2019, we actually found evidence that they were in fact used. Before then, we just saw them on paintings and such. What would happen is men and women would wear this cone, and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone, and the cone itself was made of oils, fats, resins, and it would be placed on their wig or directly on their head to make them smell better as the day went by. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. Number four, Krakos. Today's footwear is pretty comfortable. We have shoes that correct your stride while you take your morning jog. We have Crocs, which, you know, they're just a blessing, you know, just in general, they're great. Krakos were a style of shoe commonly worn in the 15th century in Europe. The thing with these long-toed shoes, they first appeared in the 12th century and they would come and go over time as most fashion trends do. But the Krako, this thing was twice as long as your foot. People are tripping over these things left, right, and center. They look ridiculous. Why were they so long? Why did they keep coming back over and over? Named after the city, of course, that they were made in, Krakows were used by both men and women, but as cheeky as it sounds, the longer the shoe, the cooler the dude. Yeah, size did matter. These things would be stuffed with horse hair or moss, but the insane part is, is that these things were so long, a string would have to be tied from the tip of the shoe to your knee, so it was like, you know, had to have the cool curve. You had to have that interesting curve. We need to bring these back immediately. Imagine tying a Krako to your knee before prom, you'd be fired up. You'd be doing like the sea walk in no time. Number three, wigs. Okay, I mentioned the macaroni look, little hat with a big wig, but wigs were such a big deal that they deserve their own point on this list. You see it so often in movies and TV, any plot that takes place in the early 17th century, it's just wigs galore. This all began when Louis XIII of France wore a wig to hide his baldness. Yeah, people love copying royalty. Even when Queen Elizabeth's teeth were black and rotten from eating so many sweets, people copied that look. They made their teeth look rotten because, well, obviously, that's the cool thing. Gross, don't do that, brush your teeth. In the 17th century, syphilis was also to blame. This was a bad time in Europe, of course, long before antibiotics, most things were pretty bad. But the side effects of syphilis include sores and hair loss. What better way to hide the fact that you're losing a bit of hair than to wear a wig nine times as noticeable in public than if you were just to have patchy hair? This is a solution, I guess. It kicked off with Louis XIV at just age 17. He hired 50 wig makers. His cousin, Charles II, he was going gray around the same time, so he too wore a wig, and then everyone thought wigs were cool, and then Bob's your uncle. I'm starting to go gray already. Next time you see me, I'll be wearing a 17th century lice-filled, flammable, stinky wig, because that's better, apparently. Number two, bombasting. The origin of stuffing your bra, let's do it. Mr. Boombastic, is it fantastic after all? What does it even mean to call somebody boombastic? What is this? Well, back in the 16th century, if you looked like a literal couch, you were considered royalty. The bigger the belly, the bigger the arms, the bigger the everything, the better. Size mattered a lot back then. Men and women would stuff cotton, wool, or sawdust. Yeah, they would stuff sawdust in their clothing to appear more muscular, or to seem like they ate a lot. Now it's so funny because while of course this makes sense in history and stuff, like I just mentioned, the legs of these guys were always so hmm, tiny. They would more often than not make their arms look ripped and their bellies huge, but they still needed to move around and be like, ah oh, yes, and like, you know, that whole my lady stuff. A guy the size of a minivan isn't intimidating. It looks more uncomfortable than anything. And in case you're wondering, yes, men would usually stuff just one part of their trousers. That's just false advertising, my friend. And finally, number one, bustles. All that junk inside your trunk, what are you going to do with it? Saving my personal favorite for last, of course, bustles were a fun little mix of everything on this list. This was also known as the Grecian Bend. It came to town in the 1870s. Now remember how we'd wear cage dresses that extended six feet and was just non-practical in any way? Well, they modified that so it was basically just your behind that was poofed out. This fabric was draped behind the butt. That was the, uh, uh, uh. 
The fabric was usually draped behind the butt, that was the original style, but some people got smart and began stuffing the back just to make it, you know, a little higher, a little bit bigger, a little bit more, hmm, a little more mm, to it, and then eventually you look like an absolute dump truck. So some eyes were facing you, which was a bonus back then. The bustle, looking back at it, pun intended, is ridiculous. This was not comfortable or practical at all. It began as a small piece of fabric that would hold the dress up, and then it became this. Whenever I see this style, I always think of Aunt Fanny from the movie Robots. That movie is criminally underrated. I'm gonna end on that thought. Go watch Robots. <laughs> Number 10, the hobble skirt. This is a bad idea written all over it. The hobble skirt, also jokingly called the speed limit skirt, was a dress with a very tight hem, making the poor lass who's wearing its movement, well, not having much of it. Can't have the wife running off from her home now, <laughs> even if that, you know, that meant the home was not a good place and men acted really bad back then. But no, you can't have her running away. Apparently though, some were so tight that it caused women to fall, and in some extreme cases, I, I can't believe this, those falls were fatal. What? Number nine, muslin dresses. Honestly, I can see celebrities doing this today. Okay, so the female figure. It's sleek, it's curvy, it's gorgeous. Today a girl's got some options on how she wants to flaunt what her mama gave her. You go, girls. But back then, well, not, not so much. Except for the muslin dress, apparently, which I find strange at the time, since seeing a woman's ankle could give a guy a stiff neck for hours, if you catch my drift. Essentially, this was a dress that you had to wet first, like a, a gentle misting, if you will. Yeah, weird, right? And then you'd wear it out. Now, for the summertime, this makes sense, and honestly, I might support this myself, actually. See the curves, stay cool. However, some stories tell us of women who wore this during cooler weather and then got sick. Fashion over function, ladies. Be careful. That's a silly one. Oh, 40 below, I better wear my muslin dress. Yes, I'm just gonna walk out. <laughs> Number eight, ladies wear. Okay, this is a general one, but ladies dresses and wear in general was just ridiculous. I mean, I mean those big poofy dresses, it just seems like ladies had it rough. When have they not? Wear a dress that's too tight or so big you struggle to walk around. Not to mention the fancies of dresses have wire, wood cages and frames. Just making walking around more difficult because yeah, that makes sense. For me, anytime I wear formal wear, I keep an eye out for bathrooms. You never know when you need to go. However, I just can't imagine trying to squeeze the lemon on those bad boys. Whew, that would be difficult. To make matters worse, there are stories of women wearing just regular big poopy dresses and then getting in accidents at factories. And yes, it was gruesome. And yes, they didn't make it out. And no, there's no movies about it. Stop asking. Number seven, pestilence fabrics. Last time I was talking about the Victorian era, I mentioned a few points on fabrics with harmful and dangerous chemicals, which happened more than it should have. It shouldn't happen at all, really. It's kind of sad. Well, that wasn't the only fabric-related issue that was out to get you back then. For example, wealthy people couldn't be bothered to do their own laundry. I hate doing laundry, I don't blame you. I'm not wealthy, though. And sometimes would have them washed and taken away by launders who, well, wash clothes to the rest of the city. Being that clothes and washers themselves were poor, or that clothes were just mixed around regardless, well, that was an issue. There was a lot of sickness going around at the time, and, well, it was contagious. A lot of times, these sicknesses would cling to fabrics, and when given back to their customers, well, they could very well come down whatever London was feeling at the time. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun. I, I, I think I'll just wear more of my dirty stuff. I'll just wear my underwear for six months straight. It was white when I bought it, not anymore, but it's okay. Number six, lead. Here we go again. Lead, just lead in general. It was used in so much stuff. Seriously, it, it's scary. Especially because they knew it was harmful. It wasn't a secret, they knew. I was gonna pick one leaded item, but I, I mean, I couldn't. I mean, seriously, I know this is a list about fashion, but it was involved in some clothes making processes, it was, it was in women's makeup, which that's also fashion, and it was in house paint, which I know that's not technically fashion, but it kinda is. Trust me, I used to mix paint before I was an internet comedian. I know the history of paint. Ask me your paint related questions in the comments below. I'm the guy you need to talk to. I mean, it was used in pipes too, and we drank out of those, it's just crazy. Now, it is one of those things that minor exposure to is fine, sure, but the thing was with fashion and beauty is that you probably would use said product every day, like the clothing or the makeup, and especially the makeup of the ladies. Lead poisoning symptoms include headaches, stomach pain, constipation, infertility, and memory loss. Yikes, that's not fun. 
We don't like that here. Number five, corsets. Nobody wants a waist bigger than nine inches, said everybody in Victorian times. I, for one, can appreciate the female form and the hourglass figure. It's admirable, sure, but. That being said, I, I don't think we need to go so far to keep the female form in shape. The corset's a little too much. Corsets were those chest tightening, gut sunking, push all to mince meat to the top of the pie apparel that went under every woman's dress or every fat dude in his 50s who wants to feel 29 again. I don't think I have to tell you why this is bad or uncomfortable. The human chest needs to breathe, and when something's that tight around you, well, you struggle to breathe. Uh, trouble breathing, fainting were not all too rare, especially in hot and humid climates. For my generation, you may recall Elizabeth Swan had issue with hers in Pirates of the Caribbean. And then she fell, and then Jack Sparrow caught her, and it was a good movie. But don't, the corsets, I just I can't get behind them. Number four, foot binding. While not exclusively done in the Victorian era, it was started in ancient times and continued all the way up until the 20th century, thus includes the Victorian era. A Chinese fashion tradition that takes women's feet and binds them and squeezes them until they begin to change shape. Oh, poor ladies. Again, I don't think I need to tell you that forcibly changing bone and muscle structure in your feet just for fashion is a bad idea. I think you all know that. For starters, it doesn't look right. After years of binding, the shape of the foot drastically changes. Secondly, the health risk of doing such is not worth it. Oftentimes, toenails fall off or become infected. Ugh, gross. Bones break and pierce skin. It's a bad time all around. Thank God we stopped doing that, right? Jeez. Oh, thanks. Number three, lard wigs. Wigs have been around for a long time. If you're a fancy politician from Washington, you wear a powdered wig, singing Yankee Doodle Dandy all the way to the Capitol building. Balding men, women, or really anyone can wear a wig. It's, it's really for everyone. What I'm getting at is it's been around for a long time and we've come a long way. Given enough time and asked to tell the difference, I probably couldn't. I, I, really, I really couldn't point out a wig if, if you showed me. So we're getting really good at it these days. That being said, in the Victorian times, wigs were quite common and were fashioned with a peculiar substance. Lard, yes. Imagine every day of the week without proper baths or showers and living in close proximity to the Thames River. And you take a handful of pig lard and just slather that in your wig to style it. Put a gross sound effect in there, just gross sound, ugh. Do you imagine the smell? This is the most offensive hair crime since frosted tips in the early 2000s. Those were a big mistake too, I gotta say. Not, I had them, but it was. there's only one man who can pull that off. And he's in Flavortown, you know what I'm talking about. Number two, German helmets. 1914 was the end of the Victorian era and the beginning of the modern era. It's actually a very fascinating time. It's kind of like modern meeting the past, really cool. Well, fashion just doesn't mean civilian. Anyone who's ever spent time in the Marine Corps knows that they gotta look their best. Wah, well, Marines. The Empire of Germany was no different in 1914, and a lot of German soldiers wore helmets with an ornamental spike, like a Koopa from Super Mario. I know you guys have seen the movies, you, you, you've seen them. Except the main issue here wasn't an overweight Italian plumber jumping on their heads, uh, but the war and the enemy itself. World War I was fought in a lot of trenches, so it's kind of awkward when you can see a bunch of little spikes moving up and around the enemy's trench. It's also kind of dangerous to have an extra piece on your helmet as you can get caught in weird places like barbed wire, and yes, if you're wondering, sometimes they were used in the absence of a good melee tool. Yeah, you'd be correct, sometimes they did. You gotta do what you gotta do. Oh, brutal. Number one, French uniforms. More World War I, but it's still Victorian. It counts, I promise. While the spiked helmets were a very bad idea, they were shortly phased out. They learned their lesson. However, the French stood up and said, no, 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 I have a worse idea. Also, shout out to France. You guys get a bad rap for the war, but it's really your war. You guys rocked it, man. You guys are the best. Love France. Anyway, the French uniforms were a little bit of a mistake. In a classic case of fashion over function, kind of the theme of this list, they wore very bright and blue red uniforms. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but bright blue doesn't exactly blend into an environment, thus it made French soldiers a very easy target. Everything's like gray, black, and brown, and you're just wearing bright blue and red pants, yeah, you're gonna, 
You're not gonna make it far, Chief. At number 10, painting veins. Back in the 17th century in Europe, many people believed that extreme paleness was just the hottest thing. If you looked whiter than a ghost, then you were like the Megan Fox of the town. Many women were obsessed with finding new ways of making themselves look pastier than a white wall, and some of their methods were actually surprisingly creative. The cosmetic skills of women back then were actually pretty impressive, I must say. Wealthy aristocratic women were the ones who took part in this pale trend the most. They wore dresses with plunging necklines to show off the girls, and they painted themselves white using a powder. Frankly, this powder made them look pretty artificial, like you could tell that they weren't actually naturally that white, so to solve this, they came up with a new beauty trend drawing veins. Women would draw veins on their mommy milkers using a blue color to mimic the look of translucent skin. It's crazy to think how far we've come from this, because back then people were trying to look as pale as possible, and now we have people tanning themselves so much that it causes controversy. At number 9, tiny teeth. During the Renaissance, fashion and beauty standards were changed drastically from what was popular in the years before. So much in society changed over this period of time, like what was seen as beautiful or desirable. Things like certain body types and other physical attributes had their own trends, but one of the weirdest physical beauty trends from back then had to do with teeth. Back then, the ideal woman had wide hips, a small waist, long legs, and small teeth. Yeah. Teeth had an ideal size. To people back then, the smaller the teeth, the more desirable you were. Why? I don't know. Because people are weird, I guess. Some people would even go as far as to file their teeth down to make them smaller so that people would see them as more attractive. Now, I can imagine that this would be a very painful process. Like, if you've ever chipped a tooth, then you know that uncomfortable, almost cold sensation of a broken tooth. So imagine that, but on all of your teeth. Yeah, you can count me out. Before we carry on talking about some of these strange things people did to be the belle of the ball, and yeah, there were some really, really weird things, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, nails for days. These days, people get their nails done all the time. I love seeing crazy nail art videos online because they're often so creative. Some of the most fascinating ones are the crazy long nails. I don't think I could ever rock those, but I still admire those who can. The beauty trend of having long nails, though, isn't a new thing. It's been a symbol of beauty and status for many, many years, like years ago in China. Back then, having super long nails was seen as a way to show off your wealth and status. The average nail length amongst Chinese aristocrats was up to 25 centimeters or nearly 10 inches. This was all their natural nails too. And in order to protect their insanely long nails from breaking, they wore nail guards made out of gold. Not only did that protect their nails, but it was also another way of showing off their wealth because not everyone can live their lives wearing gold cages on their fingers. As you can imagine, having nails that long made it so you could barely do anything with your hands, and so that's why these aristocrats had servants, so they could perform the tasks that someone with super long nails couldn't. But would you ever want to have nails that long? <laughs> At number seven, long neck style. In many cultures around the world and for many years, having a long neck was considered beautiful, and so many women practice neck stretching in order to attain this level of beauty. This practice of neck stretching has been most commonly done by wearing metal rings around the neck, adding more and more rings over time. This practice was first seen sometime around the 11th century in Southeast Asia. The theory behind the rings is that they're so thick that they push the head up, therefore stretching the neck, but in actuality, the length Lengthening of the neck is caused by the rings pushing down on the collarbones. The origin of this practice is pretty much unknown, but it is theorized that it began as a way to make women look more attractive in order to prevent getting captured as slaves. But on the other hand, some people believe that this was a way of protecting people from getting attacked by tigers. Two very different theories, but nonetheless valid. Though this practice began so long ago, it is still a traditional body modification in some parts of the world to this day. At number six, tiny tootsies. For many years, having the tiniest feet was seen as a popular beauty trend in China. Foot binding was a big body modification practice in China that began in the 10th century AD. It is said that this whole trend started because a court dancer bound her feet and the emperor at the time, Emperor Li Yu, really liked what he saw and soon it was encouraged for other women to do the same. Soon this practice of foot binding became a huge trend and it became associated with being able to find a husband. The practice of foot binding began when a girl was 5 or 6 years old. They would have their feet put in hot water, have their nails cut short, and have their skin rubbed with oil before having their four smallest toes broken, folded over, and tied down. 
then their feet would be bent in the middle to break the arch, and the girl would have to walk around like that over time, crushing the heel and sole of the foot. After about two years, the foot would be considered ready, and depending on the size of the girl's foot by the end, this would judge how easily she'd be able to be matched with a good husband. This practice continued all the way until the 20th century, where it started to lose popularity. At number five, long skulls. One of the most bizarre beauty trends from ancient times, at least, was the process of head shaping. This unusual beauty trend caused people in modern times to think that aliens were real when remains were discovered with oddly shaped skulls. Some people believe that we had proven the existence of extraterrestrials, but in reality, it led to the discovery of an entire practice of human body modification for the purpose of beauty. The process of head shaping involves putting some kind of pressure on a baby's head so that it grows into a different shape. This was known to be done by using cloth or even boards to create the desired shape. This is one of the oldest beauty trends in history as the earliest evidence of modified skulls come from Australia and date back between 14,000 and 9,000 years ago. The skulls that were found had flattened foreheads and very prominent brow ridges. This practice also occurred quite often in South America where skulls with a variety of different shapes have also been found. I'm kind of glad that we don't do this anymore because I could not imagine going through life with a cone head. I wonder how it would feel to have a head shaped like that. My neck hurts just thinking about it. At number four, five head. Let's go back to the Renaissance for a bit to talk about yet another one of their super strange beauty trends. They really had a lot of weird desires when it came to appearances, and I'm certainly glad that this next one is no longer in style, and I really hope it never makes a comeback. Back in the Renaissance, it was believed that girls with high curved foreheads were the most beautiful, but obviously not everyone can be built like that. As people do, they came up with a way of achieving this look without having to be born with said attributes. In order to have that big forehead that people so desired, women were known to have shaved or plucked the hairs from their natural hairline to make their foreheads look bigger and therefore more desirable. They really said, receding hairline, but make it fashion. Suppose. At number three, feet painting. Now you would think that all of the super bizarre beauty trends of the past were from way back in the day, but you would be mistaken. We saw some strange practices in the 20th century as well, especially during war times. Back in World War II, a shortage of silk and nylon in America created a bizarre beauty trend. Because these materials were needed to make things like parachutes and uniforms for troops, tights were quickly disappearing from stores. Because this was such a huge staple in women's fashion, they got creative and created a beauty trend where women would draw pantyhose arrows in their legs, dye them with different colors, and try and mimic the look of mesh tights to create an illusion close to wearing stockings. I feel like if this happened in today's time, I don't think I would be that desperate to do that, and you couldn't catch me drawing or dyeing my legs for this. I think I'll just stick to wearing pants. At number two, strange corsets. Corsets have been around for a long time. They've come in and out of style, and even right now, corsets seem to be making their way back into mainstream fashion, though maybe not as extreme as back in the day. In the 19th century, having an hourglass figure was seen as the ideal body type, and so in order for many women to achieve this look, they wore corsets to cinch their waist. However, the looks were pretty extreme. Some women tightened their corsets so tight that their waist could be wrapped with two hands. Like, imagine that. Although this was seen as super chic back in the day, it was also causing some health issues because it would squish together people's organs, and as you can imagine, that's not a good thing. Eventually, of course, it's evolved so that rather than cinch the waist so much, it would just accentuate the hips to still give an hourglass shape without causing too much bodily harm. And finally, at number one, no-no piercings. How many of you guys out there have piercings? I have a few myself, I have my ears pierced, and obviously my nose is pierced, but there are so many other places that you can get pierced even in the no-no region. Back in the Victorian era, piercings down under were pretty popular and were considered to be very fashionable amongst wealthy women. Some women would have their nippies pierced and even chained together, and some men would even get their peepees some jewelry too. For women, it was all about trends, but for men back then, many of them got their nether regions pierced supposedly to make wearing tight pants pants more comfortable. This piercing was called the Prince Albert, and it was given that name based on the legend that Prince Albert got his little prince pierced in order to hide the size of his junk underneath his clothes. Whether or not that's actually true is beyond me, but I would imagine that getting that piercing would be painful. Absolutely painful. But remember, in the wise words of Beyonce, pretty hurts. 
Oh boy, was she right. Number 10. The Corset As women began to increase their mobility both socially and literally, the only word left for the binding implement was a muttered die. Seriously, these things sucked to wear. I've actually had the misfortune of wearing something similar back in my theater days, and I really don't recommend it. Interestingly, it wasn't a complete murder of the implement, as designers worked out different types of corsets designed for particular activities, the dance corset being one of them, and another being the maternity corset. I'm probably not the first to say this, but don't wear a corset if you're pregnant. As a result, the total ownership of corsets did increase due to the variety that was suddenly available. Despite this, the tides were clearly shifting against the corset, and it wouldn't be long before the implementation of the garment went the way of the dinosaur. Number 9. Raising the skirt line. If you're Amish, best look away now. Yes, while the previous decade saw a mass flourish in the extravagance of the dress, the increased mobility thing I mentioned earlier meant that women more than likely found themselves a little sick of tripping over their clothes. As a result, the skirt line began to lift, and the overall ensemble of skirt and underskirt was dropped in favor of just simplification. While normally this would have been met with outrage, the interesting component lies in how these trends were framed. See, these women weren't just being scandalous, they were being patriotic and practical. In wartime, this distinction was wide enough that the usual voices were uncommonly silent. This could also be attributed with the rumblings of the dance craze, the sudden need to go out and move requiring clothes that, you know, didn't eat your feet. Number 8. Big ol' hats for the ladies. Where the 1900s saw hats growing upwards, the 1910s saw hats growing outwards. These new hats had unusually wide brims and were designed in a way that allowed them to rest on the skull at a tilt. At the same time, short hair was becoming just as popular thanks to one Irene Castle. And as a result, both trends neatly intersected and ended up accommodating each other quite nicely. Some of these designs ranged from simple and neat to just outright bizarre. It's like there was a competition to stuff the top of the head with as much feathers, bells, and whistles as they could. As a result, these strange hats have become deeply iconic as a part of women's fashion for the time. And while they did eventually get reined back in, there are some absolutely bananas designs that you would even think would make Napoleon blush. Number 7. Bowler Hats For men's fashion, nothing was more indicative of the time than the bowler hat. While it was originally created in the 1840s, these hats rose to prominence against stiff competition from the top hats, which we all knew were fighting an up hat battle. Fedoras were still four Unfortunately, a ways away from becoming the saddest thing to grace the human eye, and so the bowler hat found a nice little niche for itself to rule quite comfortably from. A symbol of the city man, the bowler hat became synonymous with both the time period and the working man, and has remained something of a time-stamped staple ever since. Like, come on, you've seen Charlie Chaplin, the dude was born in a bowler hat. Number 6. Makeup Trends At the turn of the century, makeup was just beginning to become a little bit more accepted culturally, which led to a slow increase in its modern application. In particular, paleness had become something of the accepted norm, which women would attempt to achieve through the consumption of lemon juice or, you know, just the direct application of it to the face, probably in the eyes. The idea of appearing youthful was gaining major traction, and demands were met with an increase in beauty salons, but overapplication was still harshly criticized. Number 5. Mourning Clothes in wartime, it was common to suddenly learn of the passing of a family member or relative, and with funds strained, the process of going through the mourning ritual became more streamlined. While general rules did determine the length of mourning depending on the closeness of relations, ranging from several weeks to half a year, the actual rules of propriety regarding clothes worn was quite simple. It's gotta be black. As a result of this, it became commonplace to just simply dye everyday clothes black in place of breaking the bank on new morning clothes, as it was likely to experience more than one or two deaths a year. Number 4. The Straightening of Dresses As fashion moved onward, the common shape of the dress was actively reconsidered. Orientalism, their words, not mine, became the center of focus for a number of styles. The designer Paul Poiret 
being credited for its implementation into Western style. While the morality of this remains to be seen, it was generally responsible for moving styles away from the outwardly flowing dresses and drawing them inwards, in direct contrast to the hats. On that topic, turbans were actually also slowly making their way into popularity alongside this, though it should be clear that the majority of these decisions were made purely with the goal of just changing the common aesthetic, with little regard given for the actual cultural significance of the style. Even so, the impact was clear, and what was poofy was on its way to becoming slim. Number 3. Flora Sands not so much a trend, just more of an interesting observation. As women's fashion began to grow more masculine, the change in fashion made masculine clothes more desirable as a result. Coinciding with this was the military career of Flora Sands, who served in the Royal Serbian Army during World War I. As women weren't particularly common in the army, she was actually the first one, she struggled to make her way to the front, eager to join the fighting in lieu of working as a nurse. Finally enrolled as a private, she worked her way up in the military, becoming a captain. Now, interestingly enough, up. While attending a royal event of some sort, a member of the royal family was quoted as observing Sands and stating that she wished she could wear clothes like hers. Number two, radium hair tonic. I wish I was joking. One of the downsides of haphazardly clinging to the ideas of progress as an all encompassing good can be found in the world's slow realization of the precise dangers of radioactive materials. Prior to this, workers were made to handle radioactive materials with their bare hands, most famously the radium clock painters. While not dangerous to the customer, prolonged exposure of the mostly female work staff led to extreme illness and in most cases death. But before that horror story came to light, some dude actually tried to sell this as a hair tonic. Seriously, make your hair glow for five dollars. How many people actually bought this product was unknown, but it is clear that after the effects of of the clocks were made public, the product was subtly pulled from shelves. Number 1. The Hobble Skirt This is easily the strangest trend of the time, and a result of the aforementioned slimming of dresses. Apparently inspired by a Wright Brothers demonstration where a woman was flown as a passenger from their plane, for decency's sake she tied a rope around her ankles to keep her dress from billowing all over the place. And one designer, Paul Poiret, got an idea. This resulted in a design which would eventually develop into the pencil skirt, but mostly just ended up with women falling off of bridges and drowning. This actually happened to Ida Goyette in 1911, and earlier, a woman who was wearing that skirt was unable to avoid a loose horse on a racetrack, which trampled her to death. One of the lighter jokes that was due to the hobble skirt was that women would apparently compete in hobble skirt based races, and uh, Paul Poiret would later be quoted shamefully admitting that he had freed the bust and shackled the legs. 